um, and it's a way for us to improve our lot. So what is the role of design and sustainability from our point of view? Well, we see design as fundamentally optimistic. It makes sense. If we have designs on the world, then obviously we're going to be looking at how we can modify things to improve our quality of life. So it's all about possibility. It's all about approaching things with optimism in terms of what it could be for us. The other thing about design is we tend to, to not need all the facts to be able to make decisions and move forward, and I think that's pretty typical. We work in this world of rapid prototyping, exploring options, testing, learning, and trying to improve on things. That's fundamentally what you do as a designer. And we tend to focus on what everybody talk, terms being human-centered. It's about creating solutions for people. Um, it's about that notion of having designs of the world to improve people's lot. But I think in the future we might want to move away from just being human-centered and focus much, much more on being system-centered. And a part of the process that we go through is to really try to think much more systemically about what it is that we try to design. So how do we see the business case for sustainability changing? Well, we see that over time there has been a number of kind of step changes that have occurred. Um, and if this is a very rudimentary kind of way to look at it, but it sort of makes a little bit of sense to us. Then on the left-hand side of this model, you've got value protecting and then value creating, and I think we're definitely moving much more into this value creating st stage. And we've gone through these four steps from compliance to corporate social responsibility to niche green marketing to now probably more like ma mainstream massive change. What are we going to do to really make things happen from here? So moving beyond compliance to CSR, we've seen CSR as a way to basically legitimise and support what an organisation does. Um, it, it's its moral obligation and its commitment to its community. It's a way to, to benchmark itself against its peers and com competitors. It provides a bit of a licence to operate, and it's a very good way to protect reputation in terms of what you're doing. So it's a step up from the compliance debate, and we see it as a pretty important step. Moving on from that, we've done a lot of research here on what is the growing demand for greener products and services, um, and connecting back to uh, Gwen Rogers' research that everybody saw a few weeks ago, the LOHAS um, segmentation. We've seen a similar type of thing here, um, but we've also seen this big push to try and market products and services to greener consumers, so niche green products for niche green consumers, and the image we have here is a recycled plastic battery-powered lawnmower. Obviously somebody's decided that this is a pretty good way to target a greener market, but I guess the fundamental question we have to ask is are we really going to be mowing lawns in the future, and do we really want to position sustainability as just a niche green market activity, or do we really want this to be mainstream? And we believe that the push more and more is to make this mainstream rather than niche. So we see it moving another step forward, a step change again to thinking beyond green markets to mainstream markets and massive change that I think people are starting to want to see. Um, the image here is from the rally last week in Copenhagen, which was one of the best, biggest rallies that was ever taken place at a global level. I think it's a really clear signal that people want to see some sort of step change and we think sustainability is going to become much more mainstream and we're going to approach this in a, a different way. And we're not the only ones saying this. Uh, Harvard Business Review came out with a white paper about three months ago saying sustainability is the only driver of innovation. Um, and C.K. Prahlad said, the reason for this is because there's really no other option but sustainable development. It doesn't have to be negative, it has to be positive, it has to be optimistic, and I think that's where the role of design should fit. So we talk about sustainability 2.0. Um, and this is an airline, this is somebody much smarter than us, but we think this is very apt. Um, we see sustainability as not just what you do well or do good. Um, it's not a green product extension or just a CSR policy. It's everything. It's a total business strategy. We see it becoming mainstream, and this is kind of the reality of that. So how do we bring design to sustainability? And this is something we've been pushing and thinking about for quite some time, quite a number of years, as we've been consulting in this space. So I'm going to start off with a simple analogy. Now, as kids, I'm sure we've all made paper planes, right? Paper darts, we've probably thrown them around the school ground. I think it's a nice way to start to think about how do we use 
this next plays model. This is a way for us to help explain what we mean by that. So we want to use this paper plane to kind of represent our enterprise. Now we, it makes no difference whether it's a social enterprise, a business enterprise, or like a city project or a city enterprise. It's a way to think about the models that we have. Now, we build a model like this because we have an idea where we want to take it, how high we want to fly it or grow it, and where we want to end up somewhere out there in the future. Um, maybe that's an exit strategy for a business or it's delivering some hard outcomes at some point. And we tend to build these based on a set of conditions, economic conditions, environmental conditions, etc. So it's a way that we know that it will keep flying. And we're not too concerned about its wake, we're really worried about where it's going to head into the future. That seems to make a lot of sense to me that we build models based on conditions that we tend to know or we think might be in our immediate future. But we know out there in the future that there's quite a lot of turbulence and it's a bit like me, if I threw this paper plane representing my business model across the room here aiming at a target, there's a good chance it might get there. But if I open the window, and it's a particularly windy day here in Wellington today, we'd probably find that that paper plane would go completely off course. So how do we understand the future? There's a lot of turbulence coming our way. Some of it good, some of it bad. We've got issues like climate change, which we've been hearing a lot about. Um, there's security issues, there's different sorts of market pressures, social justice issues, technology changes which are huge and apparent and coming at us rather quickly. So this turbulence is going to cause the conditions that this model flies in to become pretty unstable. And typically we've used sustainability as a way to kind of think about how can we try and control its flight plan. Like how do we try to manage those turbulences coming at us because we have society asking questions of business organisations much, much more now um, or just dealing with other environmental conditions that, that come our way. So we use these triple bottom line approaches, thinking about finance, thinking about social issues, thinking about environmental issues as a way to kind of manage the conditions that which this aircraft or this model flies. No, those are the conditions coming at us and those are the conditions we leave behind. What we're trying to do is manage our model as best we can to work inside a set of conditions. But those conditions are looped. They're a big feedback loop. So we understand it from this point of view because in terms of natural systems they tend to regulate their conditions for their own survival. Um, but Books like Gaia make a pretty good case for the fact that the biota actually regulates its own conditions for its own benefit. So we have to say here that this model has a way to actually influence its own conditions. It has a way to actually improve on that feedback. So we really want to understand what are the outcomes at a social, environmental and financial level that this model actually has going forward. Well, we talk about NextPlays as a platform for sustainable design. It uses future drivers to consider and prototype sustainable, profitable strategies. We use scenarios a lot as a way to frame up what the future's like, and we use that to then sit down and consider how might we go about designing this better. So it's a way to engage. It's a bunch of workshops and tools that we've developed to help organisations think about this in new ways. So I just want to talk a little bit more about how do we build empathy with the future, how do we design better models and test and consider the results of those.